delving into ancient Jewish texts and deciphering Hebrew's hidden meanings, Rabbi Daniel Lappin welcomes you to Tower of Power, Decoding Secrets of Babel. Now, here is today's program. Well, hello, and let me introduce myself. I am Rabbi Daniel Lappin, and this is my beautiful wife, Susan, who uh, I should tell you is a sharpshooter. Her specialty is uh, 25 yards with a 357 Magnum revolver. And all I can tell you is that uninvited visitors late at night to the Lappin household, well, it's possible I might miss you, but Mrs. Lappin, she won't. This must have some connection to the topic, but I'm not sure what it is. Oh, absolutely. No, very much so. And uh, what it has to do with is our basic uh, mission, which is to make ancient Jewish wisdom accessible to everybody. And uh, we live near the city of Seattle in Washington, and we travel the entire country. Uh, as a matter of fact, we even travel outside the country in order to make sure that as many people as possible are equipped with the tools to be able to understand and gain insight into what lies behind today's headlines and what is the real story behind the Bible stories and what do you need to know that transforms scripture from strange stories and weird legends into a living breathing map to how to run your life in matters of family and friendships, faith, finances, everything is found within the Bible. And you know, this used to be clearly known because uh, I'm always fascinated by history and, and when you were homeschooling, we were homeschooling the children, we did, a lot did of an awful lot of history. history. And so at, from an early age, our children knew about the founding of the United States of America. Uh, they also knew about the second governor of the Plymouth Colony and uh, his name was William Bradford. He came over on the Mayflower, a deeply religious Christian who actually wrote the first 20 pages or so of the manuscript of his history of the Plymouth Plantation, he wrote that in Hebrew. And I've actually got Xeroxes of that manuscript. It's extraordinary. And he actually says there, he says, you know, if you ever want to know why it is that I found it necessary to study Hebrew, the Lord's language, he said, I had to do it because this is the language in which God spoke to the patriarchs of old. This is the language in which Adam named everything. Everybody has to know and everybody has to understand it. Well, we're not going to be teaching people to, to read no, and understand Hebrew. Write 20 pages. Uh, in, and in the next few minutes, we're not going to be able to teach people how to, uh, how to talk Hebrew. No, we're not going to do any of that. But, but they should at least know what a part of their heritage it is. And it wasn't just Bradford, it wasn't an exception. Up until the 1900s, a commencement speech at Harvard was given in Hebrew every year. I mean, all the universities that were founded in the 1600s and the 1700s were actually Bible seminaries. They were founded to teach the Bible to Christian youth. Well, one of the great Christian preachers of the colonial times was Cotton Mather, and uh, he actually referred to uh, Yale University as our New England, and now he uses the Hebrew word, Beit Midrash, which means a house, house of, of study, study or a Bible seminary. That's how they used to think of universities in those days. So they knew the Bible in the original Hebrew, and that's one of our missions is to share that so that everybody can at least have an inkling into the, the ancient Hebrew and what it reveals about Scripture. And we like, we like to use as an analogy uh, the instruction manual that you find in the glove box of your new car you don't throw that away. That tells you how to get maximum safe and, and uh, lengthy usage from your car. Well, in exactly the same way, knowing how to understand the deep insights buried like treasure within Scripture will provide you with insights into how to improve every aspect of your life, financial and social and religious, everything. Why don't we talk about an example, shall we? Okay. Well, uh, God at the beginning of uh, Genesis seems to be very cheerful. I mean, what, oh, there, everything's, everything's good. wonderful, right? Whatever God makes, he looks at it and it was good. I mean, like everything, it's, it's, it's incredible. And uh, only at one point, oh, by the way, the eighth time that God says it was good is? Gold. Gold. That's a, that's a whole other topic that's in a, itself. But it's a very important topic because if we feel that money is evil, then 
We mustn't we be no surprised if we never have any of it, because we are created um, as souls. God touched us, and uh, we don't do real well at things that we feel bad about. No. And so uh, the eighth thing that God says is good is the gold, and of course gold is the metaphor for money throughout all of Western civilization's long and exciting history. And um, then for the very first time, we kind of see God getting a bit grumpy. We do. And first time. What is it? What's it about? Not good. It's the first time God said something not good. I'm all on the edge of my seat. Like, what is it? What's not good? Everything's been terrific up till now. Not good for man to be alone. Now, let's for a start not fall into the trap of thinking that that applies only to Adam's matrimonial prospects. This is not only about whether Adam is going to get married now or not or whether God is going to now create Eve. That is true. That is a specific application of the general principle. It's a specific application to Adam. But the general principle applies to all of us. Like the, the Bible is really like to be an alone. onion where you can look at the outer surface and on the outer surface it means I think I better make a help made for Adam. But you can peel off that outer surface and now we have a lower meaning well what does it mean to say not good for man to be alone why doesn't it say not good for women to be alone well women alone let me put it this way let's say you are uh, your car breaks down in a very very scary part of town late one night it's very dark no street lights you are terrified and guess what doesn't it always happen like this your cell phones out of batteries and uh, you see six large-ish figures approaching you from the end of this alley and you are terrified. You don't know what is about to happen. And all you can see sort of silhouetted in the darkness, you just see these are six silhouettes coming at you. Tell me something, would you be relieved to find out that it's six girls instead of six men? I think so. Men without women are much more scary than women without men. What is more, Let's imagine these six figures approach you and you're shaking and trembling and you don't know what's going to happen because you think it's six guys looking for trouble. As they come close enough, you discover it's not six guys. It's three men out for a walk with their wives. Do you or do you not heave a great sigh of relief? Absolutely. Everybody does. And so we see clearly that it's not only is it not good for men to be alone without wives, but it isn't good for society for there to be men without wives. Now, there's an important insight right there before we go any further. And even more so, though, on another level, it's not good for people to be alone. You don't do very well if you're on your own, if you have no family and no friends and no neighbors and no relationships. That's not really a yeah. person who's thriving because we need each other. That's we need exactly to bond right. together. So we need individuals, husbands and wives, need to bond together. But we need to bond together with, with lots and lots and lots of other people. And, you know, one of the, um, they've done studies. And when you analyze successful people, one of the questions they ask to, to find out what made you successful is how many people would pick up the, if you called somebody and said, this is so, you know, this is John Doe calling. How many people will answer that phone call? How many people are you connected to? And I'd like to recommend to everybody to actually do this experiment, which is, you know, when, when, when this show's finished and uh, you have a chance to sit down, you should really make a list of how many people, not counting family members, but how many people would take your phone call? If you just picked up the call and said, hi, can I speak to you? you could do family you? members. I think that's a well, big you know asset what? if you have lots of siblings you know, and cousins. You're right. You're right. That's, that's an a, important that's part of you it. You give your children is you're to give them family. Uh, you know what? I, I'm, 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 I feel <laughs> so silly uh, you know normally knowing that you're a crack shot with a 357 <laughs> magnum that keeps me in line I usually am very careful not to say anything wrong but I well, slipped up I'll on that let you one. Go on this one okay fine so now we know uh, make a list and the reason I say this is you in six months time do it again and in a year's time do it again if you are living your life successfully the number of people you know the number of people who think of you as a friend should be increasing it should be going up the number of the way I like putting it is the number of people who would take your phone call should be going up year by year by year. And if, you do, if that's not happening, it's a mistake. And I'll tell you why. And it's, it's a beautiful lesson here. Why is it that in the temple in Jerusalem, salt was a requirement on the, the sacrifice? Sacrifices. Yeah. Now, it's kind of interesting because 
in the West, and again, this is, this is something which was not known in other parts of the world, in Asia and in Africa, but in the West, in Western civilization, people always used to put a cellar of, uh, of salt, a little uh, salt container on the table. That was a carryover from the idea that um, the altar in the temple has been replaced in a certain way by our dinner tables where we sit with our families and we have a meal and just the way the, high, the priests used to use salt on the offering we put salt at the table and, and we do that not because our bodies need extra salt every doctor will tell you you get enough salt from the food you eat uh, our bodies need many minerals, not just salt, and yet right. nobody puts we on the table. We, we need potassium, we need iron. Nobody says, oh, excuse me, could you pass me the potassium? Or, hey, has anybody seen the iron filings? No, you don't do that because you get all these minerals from your veggies. Just remember, eat all your vegetables. <laughs> and, um, and the same is true for salt. But the reason salt is there is religious because salt is chemically known as sodium chloride. Sodium and chlorine are the two Ooh, elements of that's salt. That's sounding bad. I know chlorine in a pool is not something you want to chug. No, chlorine <laughs> is sheer poison. And if any, if possible, sodium is even worse. And there's a powerful message that God has given us by telling us to use salt on the sacrificial altar. The idea is that you can take two potentially lethal substances like sodium and chlorine and you can bring them together and you get something which is necessary for your health it makes french fries taste great and it's something that everybody uses all the time in cooking and uh, this is the important day. in other words bonding and joining and connecting with people is absolutely crucial sometimes even there can be people who on them so, uh, on their own individually are toxic and even dangerous and non-productive people Especially and you single see this men. Single, single men, men particularly lots of the time a lot of the dangerous. time single men dangerous not effective not a really good thing for society we really all do better with single men who marry and that's one of the ways we see the salt principle at work you take two individuals each of whom by themselves could be not not very good perhaps even bad perhaps even destructive bring them together you have a thing called a marriage and all of a sudden there's a new entity Sodium and chlorine have turned into salt. We do it with friendships. We do it with business transactions where I have something to sell and I really can't do much with it by myself. You need that thing. We get together, we do a transaction. I sell it to you and God smiles down because we've turned two problems into one beautifully elegant solution. And all of this is because not good for man to be alone not good for any of us to be alone we need to be bonded and we need to be connected and we want you to stay with us here because one of the things that uh, we are now going to show you from our Torah teaching Tower of Power decoding the secrets of Babel we are going to provide you with hours of scriptural instruction exposing secrets from the Lord's language that will enable you to recognize how terribly important it is for you to expand your connectivity to increase the number of bonds and connections you have with other human beings. All of that here with me, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. If you've enjoyed the rich wisdom of Rabbi Daniel Lappin, then we invite you to delve deeper into the mysteries of Genesis with Tower of Power. Decoding the Secrets of Babel. This Torah teaching best yields its secrets when conveyed by the voice from the rabbi's lips to his students' ears. This audio series includes The Curse of the Skyscraper, Baseball with Cain and Abel, and Pharaoh and the European Economic Community. This handsomely packaged volume includes a Hebrew language study guide too. To order, call 866-338-5033. And for your donation of $50 or more to TCT, you too can still enjoy Rabbi Lappin's easy blend of wisdom and humor while gaining powerful tools for defending your family, faith, and finances. Reserve your audio volume of Tower of Power today. Welcome back. And when we, before we went to our break, we were speaking about bonding and how important it is to bond. 
And one of the things we discuss on the CD, Tower of Power, Decoding the Secret of Babel, is how you can get a warning sign if society is going in the wrong direction when the bonding, the, the links that connect people break apart instead of making more links. Because the more links you have, the better off you are. And one of the things that happens, there are two ways we can relate to each other. The, we can all relate like spokes on a picture of a bicycle wheel, right? You have spokes and they're all going to that hub in the center. But the spokes aren't connected to each other. They're all connected through a central hub. Well, when society starts moving to the point where we all connect through a central hub, the hub takes something from this spoke and then it gives it to that spoke and then it takes from that spoke and it moves it to that spoke. That's a, that's a sign from the Tower of Babel that things are not going in the way they should be. Really, it should look more like a spider web. And there, the sp I, mean, I don't want to say God is a spider, but I'm just using the analogy. The middle is God, but what do you have in a spider web? All the, the connections go this way as well. In other words, everything is connected. And if, if I think of it on our family, just to bring it really down, if I think of it in a family, let's say one of our kids, we've been blessed with seven wonderful children, but let's say one of them is going through a rough time, maybe a rough financial or personal time. We can call all the other kids and say, hey, you know what? Give us, send us something. Maybe send us a little extra cash and we'll pass it on to another child. Which we'd hate. Which would be terrible. Yeah. Or we can say, you know what? Each of you need to reach out to this child. And, and some of you may reach out with time. Some of you may reach out with a letter. You might reach out with a phone call. You might reach out with money. But you've got to connect to each other. We've done our job well as parents if our children feel responsible for each other and feel love for each other. And God, as the parent of all of us, he, he's happy when the same thing happens, when we all feel responsible for each other. And that's the bonding that we want to take place, and it's the bonding that was being destroyed by the people in the generation of the Tower of Babel. And that's really the, the great dream of Nimrod, is to shatter those links that join citizens to one another. And that's why one of the things you will find taking place in, uh, in almost any society that is moving towards the socialistic uh, dream of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel is always going to be things like public transport is preferable to motor cars. Because motor cars allow individuals c to connect with each other at their own whim and at their own choice. But public transport keeps everybody linked to government. We know where everybody is traveling, what everybody is doing, as long as we keep everybody on public transport. And, uh, and the goal there is to shatter the links. It's one of the reasons that one of the first casualties in a society moving towards socialism um, is the right of free assembly. Uh, there are always restrictions that begin to be imposed upon people getting together. And one of the things that distresses us so much is the extent to which Christianity is being persecuted in China. Where That's right. You're not allowed to get together with more than a, a very few, a small group of people, because... God forbid, you should get together and worship God instead that's of the government. That's exactly right. And so that's your um, hub and spoke analogy where tyrannical regimes, the Tower of Power, Nimrod, and the, and the story of Babel, always revolves around this idea of a tower, which is basically something everybody can see. No matter where you are, everyone's eyes are focused on that central tower. That central tower represents the central power of a large and, 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 and very overbearing governmental force and the, the spokes mean that everybody turns to government. Government takes your taxes and government gives you your housing and gives you your medicine and educates your children and gives you your retirement. And how do they get people to go for that? They ah. get because they promise. And this is why Nimrod, again, this is a very clever, and we, in chapter 10 it speaks about Nimrod being a hunter. Everybody was hunting. There was meat allowed ever from the time they got off the ark. Yeah, why would the verse in Scripture say, and Nimrod was a mighty Comes hunter? right in the middle. It seems yeah. to be just Everybody thrown in there. Everybody was a hunter. There. Well, he was hunting people. He was seducing them with words and with promises, and he was playing on their best human impulses. Yes. He was saying, look, some people are hungry, and some people aren't as talented as others, and some people don't do as well as others. So... We can't, we're too weak as an individual human being to take care of each other. Let's all get together and we'll do it as a group because we have so much more power as a group and it sounds good. And one of the ways we can tell that people's intentions were good is the Hebrew words that are used to refer to people in this chapter 11 
versus at the time of the flood. This is so Different important. Different words in People Hebrew. really have to understand. If you go back to chapters 5, 6, 7, you take a look at the story of the flood. Obviously, people have upset God there, and the flood is a response. Now we come to chapter 11, and we're looking at, obviously, people are upsetting God because God reacts and says, we better go down there and sort this out. But, but it's not near the, same. the same. He's not wiping reaction. them out. Not at all. And so what we can tell is, first of all, how Scripture refers to the people. Back at the time of the flood, where God's response is, there's no hope. This entire generation has to go, and we need to begin all over again. They are referred to in the Hebrew as basar, which means flesh. It's That's, meat. It's meat. It's a very demeaning way to refer to people, isn't it? I mean, to this day, we're uncomfortable. People even speak about certain places where singles get to meet. Many women say, you know what, it feels like a meat market. I didn't care for it very much at all. Meat, when referred to human beings, is demeaning. It means you've lost. The people have lost all their spirituality, all that's left. It's They're just like the animals. Flesh. Yeah, They're just, just the, like animals. In just fact, meat. worse than animals, really, because animals at least... Had no way of having that spiritual part. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so there's two things. And when it comes to the tower, people were trying to do the right thing. Nimrod knew exactly how to appeal to them. This will be better for all of us. We'll all be better off. This is the kind, the noble thing to we'll do. We'll take care of children. We'll take care of the children. Which, and by the way, Adolf Hitler used to very good effect as well. All all, all tyrants, all use tyrants that speak about, we'll take care of the people's children. People's hearts want children taken care of. Parents and everyone else's. Oh, they'll take care of our children. Well, that's wonderful. We, we love not that. Not only our children, maybe I could children. take care of my own children, but there are other children who good don't point. have good parents. And so, so it appeals to the people. In the, the story of the instance. flood, in the Hebrew, um, the Hebrew text refers to human beings as meat. But when we come to the Tower of Babel, human beings are now referred to as B'nai Ha'adam the sons of Adam. Perfectly okay. They're not, they're not being designated as evil. They are being misled by a pretty bad leader whose name is Nimrod, but they're not they're evil. They're being misled by their best instincts because the only thing they're, they're not doing right is they're not asking, is this how God wants me to run? But the, the instincts are all noble. They want to do the right thing. And not only the name for the people is different, but the name for God is different as well in the Hebrew. The God and the name used for God in the flood is a God of judgment. People should know that in Hebrew there are a number of different words. Many and different you'll words. find it in the translation sometimes. Some translations refer to God or the Lord. The Lord, the Those Almighty. But different. I don't know. I don't think in English they actually but stick in with Hebrew, it. But in Hebrew, it really stands out and it's very important. Attention. And, uh, and it's one of the things we show in our study guide in Tower of Power. Knowing that people, knowing that you don't read Hebrew, you can look at a letter, though, and you can say, hey, that's the same shape or that's a different shape. And so you can see where the same name is used and where a different name is used. And so the name for God at the flood is the, the name that is used in the Hebrew Bible whenever judgment is being called. Where it's, it, where, it's yes, harsh, harsh judgment. Things have to be fixed up. And that's, what name is used, though, at the Tower of Babel? When we come to Tower of, uh, Tower of Babel, uh, the name for God is a, the, the, the name that speaks of, of a more gentle and compassionate God not being ready to, to, to punish, but God coming to repair. And that's really what's happening. He's not punishing the people of the Tower of Babel. He's repairing the situation. God wanted a diversity. He wanted people to be able to live in different places. In the chapters leading up to the Tower of Babel, you can read about that. And here, he tried to, Nimrod tried to gather everybody together to eliminate the opportunity for different people to connect with one another. And one of the ways he did that, the very first verse in chapter 11 is they were all one language. Sounds great. No, it's actually not because one of the first thing a tyrant tries to do is take control of the methods of communication. The government should own the TV stations and should own the radio stations and should supervise the newspapers, which is exactly how it was in Soviet Russia. God is giving a gift by spreading out so that one tyrant cannot reach everybody. Right. This People is a should gift. Have. That's exactly right. And so there we, we have this idea that whenever tyrants try to take control, uh, they, they, the, the inevitable victim is a free press or a, a free journalism. That goes by the board, and instead you're provided with government information sources. And, uh, and so there we have the story of, of one language. It doesn't just mean one language, but it means one core system of communication that was, is within the hands 
of the, of the man Nimrod himself. Well, I want you to stay tuned because uh, we want to make it possible for absolutely everybody to have access to our Genesis Journeys teaching, Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel. And that's why it is that uh, you're going to find uh, a number on your screen. And uh, make a note of that number. Or, website or call also, it I and, believe. Uh, website also. And uh, that way you can connect and you can obtain your own copy of Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel. And that way you will be effectively equipped with the tools and the information for understanding what is going on and at the same time for using those principles to increase and enhance your own life in areas of finances, of faith, of family, of friendships, all of that in Rabbi Daniel Lappin's Tower of Power. That's me. If you've enjoyed the rich wisdom of Rabbi Daniel Lappin, then we invite you to delve deeper into the mysteries of Genesis with Tower of Power, decoding the secrets of Babel. This Torah teaching best yields its secrets when conveyed by the voice from the rabbi's lips to his students' ears. This audio series includes The Curse of the Skyscraper, Baseball with Cain and Abel, and Pharaoh and the European Economic Community. This handsomely packaged volume includes a Hebrew language study guide too. To order, call 866-338-5033. And for your donation of $50 or more to TCT, you too can still enjoy Rabbi Lappin's easy blend of wisdom and humor while gaining powerful tools for defending your family, faith, and finances. Reserve your audio volume of Tower of Power today. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin, and I want to leave you with this very crucial thought. And that is, the question is not to think about, do you believe in God? Because you can say yes without it changing your life, without it forcing you to get up off that of seat and change your life. The real question is, do you believe that God spoke to humanity through Moses on Mount Sinai, 3,300 years ago. Now, if you say yes to that, all of a sudden everything changes. And one of the things you have to do for a start is make sure that you have a deeper and fuller understanding of what it was that God said to humanity on, on Mount Sinai with Moses. And that can be done in a lot of different ways. But the way that Rabbi Daniel Lappin's ministries make it possible for you to experience ancient Jewish wisdom in a way that has never been translated for everybody before. Never happened. But it has happened now. And the best example of that is something called the Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel. It's a great multi-hour audio program that you can listen to while you exercise or while you're driving while in the car or even while you're cooking. The number is on your screen and I would like you to bless me and I would like you to bless yourself as well. This has been a TCT Network exclusive production. If you would like to see more exclusive special programs, send your support to TCT, PO Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959.